Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the blessing that we have to be here, to be together. We ask you to guide us. Bless our time together. Thank you for 40 days of glory. Thank you for your mighty presence and your power. Father, we ask you to bless everyone. Bless your people. Bless your church. Bless your servants. Thank you for a great work. Thank you for greater and greater days of glory ahead. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here today. It's a real privilege and honor to be with you right here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Evangelist Shuttlesworth has been someone we've known, especially through my, my son Joshua, who's always talking to him. And um, I've heard of your vibrant church. I was watching the praise and worship, and I was wondering whether I was in America. <laughs> but it's a great blessing to be here and to share these few moments with you. I, I thank God for what he's doing. I, I hear your church is just a few months old. You know, you start standing at the age of seven months and walking like nine months. So you're not even walking yet. And look at the wonders that God is doing. So that is a blessing. So Pastor Jonathan, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a great blessing to be here. We just came in from some crusades in Cameroon. We've been going around Africa for now. We may venture outside of Africa one day soon, I believe, before Jesus comes. Amen. Today I want to share with you um, a short message on something that I believe is essential for Christianity. And I want you to just follow um, what I want to share with you. Second Timothy chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 9. Now, one time I went to Singapore and I, I saw a shop. And the shop was called There is Nothing Like Too Many Shoes Limited. Are you with me? It, the, sh the shop's name, the name of the shop is There's Nothing Like Too Many Shoes Limited. The name of the shop. And I think it's a favorite shop for ladies. There's nothing like having too many shoes. And... Um, what I want to say today is that there is nothing like being saved without being called. There's nothing like being saved without being called by God. And many of us Christians are saved but don't realize that we are also called. So 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8 says, Be the, th not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. This verse is saying, who has saved us and called us. He didn't just save us. He saved us and called us. Us is Paul and you and me. 
Apostle Paul was writing this letter to Timothy and he said, God has saved us and called us. He didn't just save us. He saved us and he's also called us. All right? So, every one of us must believe that we are both saved and called. Amen. God has saved us and called us. So, Jesus has saved me and he's called me with a holy calling. Now, the word holy means special. All right? It doesn't, holy doesn't mean just do, not fornicating. Because when we say God is holy, it doesn't mean like God doesn't for, commit fornication. Or holy doesn't just mean um, being morally good. It means being special to God for a special purpose. So that's why we have a holy tabernacle, holy table, holy, um, holy cloth, holy, many, many holy things apart from holy people. Because what it means is that it's set apart for a special purpose. So God has called you with a holy calling. Every one of us here has a special calling. A calling which no one else can fulfill. I can fulfill your calling. And you can fulfill my calling. The video you just saw, the places I've been in, Af in Africa preaching, even myself in Ghana, from Ghana, I mean, there's, there's very little communication between African countries. Uh, sometimes people say, I know somebody in Kenya, do you know the person? Africa is, is huge. In fact, if somebody's in Kenya, doesn't mean somebody in Ghana would know the person. It, it's because you don't know Africa. But Kenya is six hours for a flight from Ghana. All right? So all these countries, I mean, I, I, I would never have gone there. It's difficult to go to these places. So I'm amazed that we've even been able to go there. And if it's difficult for me to go there, I can imagine it will be even more difficult for you to go there. There are complex places, complex places with complicated situations, uh, different scenarios, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you don't know how to, you cannot go there. All right? For instance, we're just about to go to um, Central African Republic. That's the next. We're going to Madagascar. And we've been trying to go to Madagascar for the last um, how many years? It, it's, it's so complicated because they don't allow cars that drive on the, on the right. You, you have to have a car that drives on the left or on the right, whichever way it is. And they will never allow the car to come in. And so we, couldn't, we can't bring out our trucks and so on there. And anything you bring there, you have to import and pay duty on and like it's coming to stay there forever and very very expensive with narrow roads and mountains and all kinds of things to go to the towns and the villages it's it difficult and then after that we are flying into um, Bangui which is the capital of Central Africa which has not really had a government for some time so as, I, as we go there now there's you know, thousands of UN soldiers uh, thousands of uh, Rwandan soldiers and then Russians. They are the ones holding the country down, preventing it from having a war. And that's where we are going. I'm just trying to say that these are complicated places. And the call of God is special for everybody. All right? It's a holy calling. He has saved us and then he's called us. So he saved us and called us with a holy calling. Something special. And I believe that Evangelist Shuttlesworth also has a special calling, which I can never do. I can never be him. And you cannot be me. And I cannot be you. I don't live in Pittsburgh. I can't live in Pittsburgh. I don't want to live in Pittsburgh. I, I live in Ghana. You get it? <laughs> and... I want to do the work of God and I want to do the work of God as he is leading me to do. So every one of us has a special calling. Lift your hand and say, I have a special calling. Amen. And you must make sure you fulfill your special calling. Because there's nothing like being saved without being called. There's nothing like being saved without being called. You are saved and called. Read it together. 
who, let's all read it together, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Beautiful. He has saved us and called us. He didn't just save us. He saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. Like what God wants to accomplish. What God wants to accomplish in America, in Canada, in anywhere. He has a purpose and a plan. And that is why he doesn't just save Christians. He doesn't just save you. Save you for what? He doesn't just <laughs> wash away our sins and leave us on earth to just exist. He saves us and then he calls us to serve him and to follow him and to do his will and to be obedient servants to him for the rest of our lives until we go to heaven. And, and until Christians take up this special calling that they have, Christianity will become boring and, 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 and Christianity will, 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 will metamorphosize into all kinds of complicated states like we have today in the world. All right. Let's look at Ephesians um, chapter 2. Amen. It says, for, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. All right. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and to good works. So we are not just his workmanship, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So there are good works that every one of us has to do. Okay? So when you get saved, you get saved so that you can do certain good works. Amen. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So God has ordained good works that every one of us is supposed to walk in. How many are ready to walk in your good works? Are you ready to do the good works that God has for you to do? Amen. So that is a great blessing that we all have. In John 15 and verse 16, Jesus said something. He said, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So every one of us is not just saved, but we are saved and ordained by Jesus to go forth and bear much fruit. Amen. And what is the fruit? What is the fruit? Somebody said, I'm a carpenter for Jesus. I'm a lawyer for Jesus. I'm a doctor for Jesus. It's nice that you are a doctor for Jesus and a lawyer for Jesus. But what you should really be, and the real works that we are talking about, are winning souls and building churches and planting churches and raising up people in Christ. Those are the works. There's no other work. There's no other work. Let's not, let's not invent things. The Bible tells us what the works are. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. The Bible says that he went around preaching and teaching in every city and every village. So that's what Jesus came to do. And Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do also. Jesus didn't start schools. He didn't build orphanages. He didn't uh, open hospitals. He didn't do all these things. He went around preaching, teaching, healing. And if we are really following Jesus, when the Bible says that the works that I do, you shall do also. And greater works than these shall you do. The works that Jesus did are the works that we are talking about now. Preaching, teaching. And I believe many of us here are called to preach. You know, Christians must preach. Christians must travel. Christians must serve the Lord. Christians must rise up and bear much fruit. You have to win souls. And, and this whole place can be filled. 
uh, seven months old. This lots of people that are waiting to hear. Uh, people don't have any idea what to do. Uh, people are depressed. People problems with drugs, with every, any kind of problem, nobody to talk to, nobody who understands what is going on. And here we are in America uh, being saved. We're already saved, all right? But you see, you are saved and called, all right? You're not just saved, but you are saved and you are called. Can I have an amen? amen. All right. I hope I'm not talking to myself. Am I talking to myself? All right. Now, one of the things that we need to have, that uh, we need to have as Christians who have been saved and called, is we need to sacrifice. I have a book called Losing uh, Suffering. That's it right there in the corner there. Losing, suffering, sacrificing, and dying. All right? It doesn't sound very attractive. It doesn't sound very attractive, but these are four spiritual appointments for every Christian. Whether, whether the pastor says so or not. You know, Christianity is something you cannot change. You cannot modify the Bible. You cannot modify what, we, what we've been brought up on. You cannot modify the rules. I didn't invent this religion. Neither did the pastor or anyone we are here to follow what God has said we must follow. Can I have an amen? amen. So the first um, thing that you must uh, do, the, I'm talking about four appointments that you are going to go through now that you are called. How many accept the call of God? How many, how many accept that you are called? I believe this church is called. All, all of us here are called. That there's, there must be millions of people in this church area and beyond in america and all of us here are called god god didn't call a few people he called many people many are called and so god calling all of us when you do your part many people will be saved if i do my part people would also be saved but when we are called many times we shy away from the call of god and I tell you, um, from today, you are not going to shy away from the call of God. Amen. Amen. Now, the first appointment you have is losing. There's something you're going to have to lose in order to serve God properly. Are you ready to lose? You want to win, I know. But Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus said, Whosoever will save his life will lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Amen. And Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, do you have Bibles? You use your Bible? Philippians chapter 3 verse 7, it says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but down that I may gain Christ. Philippians chapter 3 verse 7 and verse 8. What things were gained to me I counted loss and I have suffered the loss of all things that I may gain Christ. I want to tell you there is no ministry and there is no work without losing something. And you see, in America, we are very comfort-oriented. And not just America, it's spreading all over the world. We have buttons for everything. You know, and now we don't even have to type. We just speak. And the phone will start working. So, we have instant coffee, instant everything. Instant everything where we, 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 don't, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't work at all. We don't lose any energy. We don't lose anything. But I want you to know that to serve God, you're going to have to lose. And you see, America, the American church, was the champion of what I am saying. 
That is why America has spread the gospel all over the world. Maybe you don't know. There is, there is no country that you cannot find American missionaries and the Assemblies of God, which is an American church, where people have labored and given up everything just so that they could preach the gospel. And they lost everything so that they could gain Christ. And that like Paul said, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but down that I may gain Christ. I want you to know that this, what I'm telling you, is America is the champion of this message. Maybe you don't know. We, we look up to you in America and admire, we've admired the fathers and the churches here and learned from them. Where my wife comes from in, in Ghana, I remember passing by, there's always this Assemblies of God mission house. You know, Assemblies of God. I was in Malawi, and uh, they put me in an Assemblies of God mission house. I was in uh, Colombia, and I was in an Assemblies of God church. I went to Malaysia, all right? The pastor, uh, who is now 80, 82 years old or so, was a combat of the Assemblies of God American missionary. I was in Singapore in a huge church and the church there was created or was, was founded by an American missionary handed over to a Singaporean. There is nowhere I've been in the world where you don't find churches and the work of God. Are, are you listening to I'm talking about the work of God which was not done by Americans who have these four things in their hearts that i must lose something jesus said if you don't lose it if you don't lose your life you if you don't you have to lose your life for my sake and this message is what produces the fruit i hope i'm not talking to myself because i could talk to myself at home number two you have an appointment with suffering amen Philippians chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. We are not only to believe, but we are also to suffer. There is suffering in Christ. There is suffering in the kingdom. All right? And because Christians have thrown away the cross and it's not a central theme, a certain level of power is missing from the church. Because we are not called just to believe in God. Thank God you believe. Are you a believer? Yes, I'm a believer. Oh, do you believe in Jesus? I believe in you. Oh, wow, we sing. Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. But we're not just to believe, but we are also called to suffer. To go through some difficulties for what reason for jesus sake for jesus sake and so christianity involves these four appointments losing something like paul said for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but down that i may gain christ and that we are called not only to believe not only are we believers but we are called to suffer you see and because we, we, we've thrown these things out. That's why now the church is becoming desolate. And it's becoming fruitless and smaller and shrinking. And the church is shrinking and shrinking into a little corner. Because it is these principles that bring forth fruit. I remember my friend in uh, Zimbabwe. His name is Tom Duchel. Tom Duchel is an American. And he, he opened... A book when he was 20 whatever years old and he saw in a map he saw a country called Rhodesia and said God wants me to go to Rhodesia that was it he didn't know where it was I think he had a word Rhodesia and then he opened the map found out it was Africa somewhere down there as a 20 something year old young man he found his way to Rhodesia and today he is there he has the biggest church in Harare in Zimbabwe Beautiful church. And he's lived there with his wife and his family 
and they all grew up in, in Zimbabwe. And you see, today, you, you, if you call, I say, I call you, I say, you, I've, I've seen a vision, you are in a Central African Republic. You may call me a false prophet. Because you may not, you may think, yourself, oh, I don't know what is happening there. I can't lose my life here. I live in Pittsburgh. I don't know what, I, I can't suffer. I mean, I need my milk. I need my orange juice. I need my bacon. I need, I need all the things I have in America. You know, but Jesus is calling us not only to believe, but also to suffer. And when you take this element out of Christianity, you've taken the power out of the church and out of, of the gospel. Amen. Then number three, you are called to sacrifice. The Bible says that I beseech you therefore, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Sacrifice is to give something that hurts you and something that really costs you. All right? And I believe that when we accept these realities, that to be a Christian is also to sacrifice whatever God wants us to sacrifice, to serve him. Amen. And then the last appointment is to die. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I'm crucified with Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that means that I've died. And he said, but you nevertheless I live. But the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who died for me and gave himself for me, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, these four things, to lose something, to suffer something, to sacrifice, and to die for Jesus and have a new life, without them, the church becomes a phantom of what it was originally. Uh, it becomes powerless. It becomes powerless. There's nothing in it. It's like a semen. Excuse me to use an example. You know, some people have a, a condition called azospermia. Azospermia means they don't have any sperms at all. But when they ejaculate, a whole lot of liquid and so on comes out like normal. But there's an element, the sperm itself is not there. So you write and the, the count is 0, 0.00, not a single sperm. So it, the, the semen is like water. It has no power. It has no life in it. It has no ability to create new life. And when you take these things out of the church, the church is there, but you've taken the element that creates the power out of the, out of the church. And it's there, all right, but there's, there's something missing and there's something gone. So we must decide that we are going to follow these four appointments. And when you follow these four appointments, you are going to have the release of power. Amen. Power will come back to the church in America. Power will come back into the ministry. Power comes from sacrifice. Power comes from the cross. The Bible says that the preaching of the cross is the power of God. The preaching of sacrifice, the preaching of giving up something, is what releases the power of God. So the preaching of the cross and preaching to Christians to give up something, to do something, to lose something for God, and to sacrifice something for God is what is going to release a power. And that's why we have so much divorce. Even though we talk so much about marriage and having good marriages, good children, and all that, that's why there's so much divorce. Because no one is prepared to suffer anything. No one is prepared to take up, to take any nonsense. It's like, well, I can't, I, I can't take this. I can't, I, I can't go through this. You know, I have to leave. I have to go because we are, we are trained not to sacrifice or to suffer anything at all. I was expecting this when I got married and I am not going to take nonsense. And so this is it. Goodbye. And so we have so much divorce, even though we have so many books about divorce, about marriage and counseling and meetings and psychotherapy and everything. 
And then marriages cannot last because we are not prepared to sacrifice. So brothers and sisters, uh, I came here to share with you that we must decide as a church to reintroduce the power element. The preaching of the cross is the power of God. Let's reintroduce into the church the element of suffering. Yes. Of fasting. See, we don't fast anymore. No, when, when I heard you were doing 40 days of glory, I would ask, are we fasting 40 days? Rarely do Christians fast. And rarely do they fast for 40 days. Oh, yes. Christians don't fast anymore. And so we've taken out the cross. But the preaching of the cross is the power. That's, that's where the power is. It's the preaching of the cross that has the power. Yeah. You know, you would think that when people sacrifice themselves... They, 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 they lose, but that is the secret of the power. That's why you have other religions where their followers sacrifice themselves, kill themselves, and kill other people. And you would have thought that their followers would reduce in the world, but they rather have more followers, and they are rather increasing and growing at a greater rate. It because they are, and, and, and it's like people say, if this is something to die for, then it, there must be something there. That's right. uh, uh, Christians don't want to suffer for anything, no. die for anything, right. stand for anything. No. And uh, other religions are ready to sacrifice and to suffer for what they believe. You know, without going through the, a certain level of power. There are many people who preach my messages. I have over 4,000 pastors that are in my church system. Many of them preach my message, but it doesn't have the same power. Because it's not just the words, but it's what, what have you been through? What have you suffered? And what have you laid down? Jesus said in John 12 and verse 24, he said, I set the corn of wheat falls in the ground unless it falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. Unless we are prepared and, and Jesus was talking about how he was going to die on the cross. Unless you go through, I mean, let, I, I don't know whether you thought about it. Why did Jesus why did Jesus die? Just three years of preaching. Three years of preaching. I mean, why not preach some more? Why not travel around? When I went to India, I went to um, Chennai. I, 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 I had one of the biggest shocks of my life. Because there I asked them, what do you have in Chennai? What can I see? They said, oh, we have Thomas's uh, Cathedral, St. Thomas. And I said, what is, what, which Thomas? He said, is it the Thomas who was with Jesus? I said, yes. The Thomas who was with Jesus came to Chennai and preached there and died there. That's why that southern part of India is Christian. I see. So when I heard that, I thought to myself, ah, if Thomas came here, then Christ could have also come to India. So why didn't Jesus come to India? Why didn't he come to Africa? Why didn't he come to Europe? I mean, why stop preaching just after three years? Because the preaching would not save the world. It's the cross and the blood that he shed on Calvary. That will save the world. Going around preaching for another 70 years will not release the power that can save the world. And so Jesus did not just continue. I don't go around keeping on teaching and keeping on preaching. But he stopped preaching. And his disciples couldn't understand it. And he said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Jerusalem. What are you going to do? They will catch me. They will kill me. They will do whatever. He told them. But they couldn't understand it. Because... The power of God is in the cross. It's in us sacrificing and giving our lives and suffering for whatever God wants us to suffer. And it's a mystery, but that is actually what God wants. And, if, and when Jesus went to the cross, remember what Jesus said. He turned to us and said, take up your cross. Take up your cross. I'm not the only one who has a cross. You also have a cross. 
and take up your cross and follow me. And because we don't take up crosses and we don't take up the cross of Jesus, we don't see the kind of power that he, he, he was seeing. And that's why today the church is shrinking. Shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. I mean, you can fight for this, fight for that, fight for whatever, but it is shrinking. It's reducing. It's reducing in its influence. It has more money than it ever had before. We have more money. We have more everything than we've ever had, but less power. Less power to change the world. Americans are afraid to go to so many places today. Oh, yes. I once invited somebody to Ghana. You know what he told me? He said, if it's safe. If it's safe. If it's safe. So safety, comfort, health, good marriage, good children, this is all that we live for. And we've thrown out the cross. And, and Paul said, the preaching of the cross is the power. Somebody asked me, how, did you, how do you get missionaries to go to the countries that you send them to? I can tell you, Ghana, where I live, is, is like a little more advanced than most of the other African countries. We are, Ghanaians are afraid to go to those places. Many Ghanaians are afraid to go to Nigeria, to go here, to go here. They don't go there. Something special must make you go there. Oh, yes. Kufi is here. He can, he can say. What I'm saying, is it true or not? It's true. Yeah. It's what? It's true. Yeah. They're afraid. You'll find Ghanaians more easily coming. There's a United flight from Ghana to America every day. And Delta every day. But you can't get a flight. You can't get a flight from Ghana to even Cameroon. There's no flight at all. There's no flight at all, or to Central African Republic, or to Mozambique, or to there's no flight a connection at all. But there's daily to Washington, daily to New York. Full. The flight is full. Go ye into all the world, means go ye into America. No. Go ye into all the world means go ye into all the world. Oh, yes. And because we are not prepared, Satan has taken advantage of our powerlessness. Our powerlessness, our fear to sacrifice, fear to give up anything, fear to go anywhere, even to go out witnessing as a church and to evangelize and to make our faces known in this city. That we are, we are encouraging you to come to church. We are, we are preaching to you. We are telling you to be saved. We are telling you to turn around. Turn away from your sins. Even to say the word hell in church. We turn it away. You can't say hell in church. What a shame. Now, there are three enemies to the, 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 the cross. You see, the devil doesn't want us to sacrifice. Remember when Jesus was going to sacrifice, Peter stood up and said, just after he had been appointed, he said, I'm not going to, you can't go to the cross. You can't die. He said, once I'm here, you will not die. And Jesus turned to him and said, Satan, get thee behind me. So that means Satan was the one speaking through Peter to prevent him from going to the cross. So Satan is afraid of the idea of sacrificing. Or that any young person or anybody in America will sacrifice himself for God. Satan is afraid of that whole idea. And so Jesus had to rebuke him and say, Satan, get thee behind me. Judas is another person. When the sacrifice was being poured on Jesus... Who was it who was against the pouring of their precious alabaster box on Jesus? Who, who was against the sacrifice of this lady? It was Judas. Judas. So the list is not a good list. <laughs> Satan, Judas. Judas was against the idea of, of pouring out this sacrifice and bestowing such honor on Jesus. He said, what is this waste for? You can't waste somebody's life. When I send people to nations as, as missionaries, people think their lives are being wasted. Uh, they are we are destroying their lives. Their lives are being wasted. People look at me and say, my, my life is being wasted doing what I'm doing. 
Instead of being a medical doctor, I'm a, I'm a medical doctor. A real medical doctor. Not an email doctor, PhD or whatever. A real doctor. I went to medical school, real medical school for seven years. Ah, when I wanted to serve the Lord and give myself to preach, hey, my, my wife's mother was not happy at all. I mean, she spoke every day. What are you doing? You married my only daughter and you are leading her to damnation. <laughs> she, he, she was not happy. She would talk to me every day. Go back to work in the hospital. Go and work in the hospital. Don't do this. You are a doctor. Go and, I, and at, at a point, I had to tell her. You know, she's a teacher, so we call her police teacher. So I said, please teacher, stop talking about this. Don't talk about this again. This is what I have decided. And I had a small church. I had a small church. I can tell you almost all my classmates live in America and work in America as medical doctors. I was with my classmate who was here. He was with me last night. Those are my classmates. They, they live here. He works in, he's, a, he's, a, he's an emergency whatever doctor. They live here. They work here as, as, as physicians for years and years and years. And I chose to stay with that little group of people and say, this, I'm going to preach to these people and I'm going to give my life to preach the gospel. I was 25 years old, 26 years old. Everybody thought I was crazy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But you see, that is what brings the power. The power is then released to, to, to build the church and to grow the church and to, and to draw people and to, and to get people to follow, to serve the Lord. Without sacrifice, you see that Judas was against the sacrifice. Satan was against the sacrifice. In the book of Daniel, the Bible says that the abomination of desolation will rise up and is against the daily sacrifice. When the abomination rises in the book of Daniel, what is it fighting? It's fighting the daily sacrifice. So the idea of sacrificing, sacrificing to God, giving up our life, fasting, giving our money to build the church, giving our children to go on missions, you hardly find anyone traveling to go on any mission anywhere from any country not only america nobody's ready to go anywhere everybody wants to be safe when you look at the news you say man there's too much danger everywhere but there's also danger now in america our safe america is changing before our very eyes yeah so today what god is saying is that it's time for us to bring back into the church, into the young men, the young ladies, the spirit of the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, if anyone will follow me, let him take up his cross and deny himself and say no to himself and let him follow me. That's why people don't even pay tithes. People don't, people don't give what they could have given. People don't give their lives to serve the Lord. People don't want their children to serve the Lord. I want all my children to serve the Lord. Oh yes, I want all my children to serve the Lord. When they go to school, it's just, it's just a formality. School is just a formality. But after that... They must serve the Lord. I give the Lord my wife, my children, and anything that I am, and anything that I have. And the Bible says that when the seed falls into the ground, it will bear much fruit. Now, I believe this church will bear much fruit if we are prepared, if you are prepared to bring the cross into the center of the church, if you are prepared to pay the price to fast, to go on outreach, to go from door to door, to go from house to house, to humble ourselves and to talk to people and to reach out to the people all around. There will be no... I'm telling you, I see it in the realm of the Spirit. I see it in the realm of the Spirit. Oh, yes. There will be no space anywhere. If you are prepared to pay the price and to sacrifice ourselves for the Lord, 
We want glory. 40 days of glory. Do you know what brings in the glory? Do you remember Solomon? Solomon went and sacrificed more than anybody else has ever sacrificed. He sacrificed the bulls, the cows, thousands of them. And the Bible says the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Sacrifice brings the glory. Sacrifice brings fruit. Sacrifice brings power. Sacrifice brings life. And it is the message of the cross. And Jesus did not lower the standards for anyone. Amen. Today I am walking in a certain anointing and a gift and a grace. But not without a price. I've paid a price. A very a price. Oh yes. And I, I tell you that if I, if I hear Jesus is going to anoint you or anybody and he doesn't ask you to pay the price, I am going to object. I'm going to object. I'm going to say, Lord, no. The price is the same price. You can't make me pay a price. And she doesn't have to pay any price for the anointing. Catherine Kuhlman used to say, no one knows how much it has cost her. Is this not her city? Yes. No one knows how much it has cost her to be there. She had to give up her husband or whatever he was. She had to give him up. Her heart was broken. She was crying. It cost her everything. And that's what brought in the power. It was after that that the power started to flow in the life of Catherine Kuhlman. And that's what brought the kind of miracles which we don't see today. High-level miracles. High-level miracles and power. High-level finances. High level of everything come in when you sacrifice. So today God is calling you and God is telling you that there is nothing like being saved without being called. He has saved us and called us. There's nothing like saved and not called. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. He saved us. Everybody say he saved us. And he called us. Yes. But when he's calling, when he calls you, you are called not only to believe but also to suffer and to lose. I have lost things. I've lost friends. Today, when they mention the list of doctors, surgeons, specialists, I'm not in that list. <laughs> I'm out of that list. But when they mention, I could have been there. But when they mention pastors, then I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm involved. I get involved. I've lost all that. And whatever it was potentially that I could have had, I don't care. Bible Paul said, I count it but dung that I may gain Christ. There is a young man here. I tell you, God has called you. In the realm of the spirit, you are going to be used by God to do great things in a foreign country. What I'm saying is it's not a new prophecy. You know it already. In Ghana, there was a man called, there's a man called um, James McEwan, a Scottish man. One day he went to church and there was a prophecy like the prophecy I'm just given in 1935. And he said, he's going to be used in a foreign land. And he said, oh, he doesn't want to go to any foreign land, Africa. But in 1937, he said, yes, Lord, I will go. He came to Ghana and he has built the biggest, he's dead now, but that's the biggest church in the whole country. They have more than 20,000 churches all over. They dominate Ghana. And they denominate in many parts of the world. Because in the realm of the spirit, God is calling people here. He's calling you with a holy calling to do what only you can do. There is a young man here, I'm telling you. In the realm of the spirit, you are supposed to walk. I see you walking in lands, in places. Places that God has called for you to stand and to minister. Your voice is like water. Your voice is like living water that is going to come to people who are dry and thirsty. Or people who are waiting and hoping. I see a dark place. A very dark place. The light is very small. But you are the light that's going to come. If you are ready to pay the price, you will see something big and something great in your life. Oh yes, there are, there are others. There are many others. And that's your calling. That's your gift. 
Your days of sitting around, doing nothing, and watching, to criticize the next pastor, and criticize the next divorce, and announce the next scandal, are over. What do you have to do with scandals? What you have to do is to busy yourself in the harvest field, and busy yourself in the work that God is giving you. Many are called. Many are called. And today, just as God, I rarely find God calling older people. I find him calling younger people. Of course, God called, God called Derek Prince when he was in his 50s. But most of the time, he will pick you out. He will pick you out and say, I need you. I want you. One day, I, I don't know if you know Derek Prince. Do you know Derek Prince in this church? There's a man called Derek Prince. He, was, he, was, he, he lived in India at a point. The British, and his father was a British uh, soldier. And he said one time, the viceroy, who was like the, 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 the governor of India, invited an officer to come to his house for dinner. Because I think he wanted to meet with him. And the, and the officer didn't go. He said, I can't come because of, of whatever. The prince says, the kind of trouble that this man had. I think he almost was dismissed from the army. And he was explaining that it's a very serious thing to be invited and to say no. And how much more for God to invite you and you say no. If that man, James McEwan, the Scottish man, the white man from Scotland, said no, you are talking about, you are talking about millions of people going to hell because one person is not prepared to give up his life. What is your life? Your life is anyway just a vapor. How long will you live? How long will you live? How long is it going to go on for? How many houses can you have? How much money can you use? What can you do with all the things you have? One day we are all going to be out of this world. In 50 years from now, most of us will not be on this earth. You can add 50 to your age. If you, can, if you, if you did maths in school, arithmetic, you add 50 to your age. 50 plus your age. Most of us will not be here. Where will you be? My father said something to me before he died. He said to me, the way you spend the first 25 years of your life will determine how you spend the next 45 years. When you are 25 to 45, is 70. By the time I was 25, I was a medical doctor. But I want to tell you, the way you spend your first 70 years here will determine how you spend the rest of the eternity, years, millions of years. The rank you have and the place you have. It's time to lift up your eyes above the temporal things that we see around us. And fix our eyes on Jesus. And have pity on the souls that Jesus died for. Oh, the people who are just looking at television to find out what to do. I mean, you see, everybody is depressed. Everybody is afraid. Everybody doesn't know what's going to happen next. And God has called you to rise up and do well. There's somebody here in the realm of the spirit. God has called you to help evangelist Shuttlesworth. That's your calling. That's your calling. You are called to help him. You are called to stand by him. And you are called to fight for him. Make sure you fulfill your calling. And you cannot fulfill your calling without paying a price. You have to pay a price. You have to follow on. And pay the price that God asks you to pay. Whatever it costs. And whatever is involved. Pay the price. When you support. When you help. When you fight for God's servants. God will bless you. And God will bless everything that you are doing. You know, the Bible says something mysterious. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let us place our hands and our hearts on the kingdom of God. Not our own lives, but the kingdom of God. And watch. And the Bible says all things will be added to your life. All things will be added. All things. I feel in the realm of the spirit, God is going to add many things. You know, this church is going to fix its eyes just on, on the work of the ministry. And God is going to add on to us things we are not working for. Oh, yes. I said, oh, yes. Things, we are not, we are, things that are not our aim. Things that are not our desire. But we just want to serve him. 
and love him. He's going to add them effortlessly. Oh, yes. God is tired of Christians who are looking for money. God is tired of Christians whose aim is to be rich and to have things. God is tired of Christians who are barren and useless to him. God is tired of Christians who, who, who are just like unbelievers. Like there's no difference between you and, 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 and somebody who is not a Christian. The, your aims are the aims of a person who is not a Christian. And God is saying, it's time to take up your cross and follow Jesus. It's time to take up your cross. I tell you, since I was 16 years old, I've been serving Jesus. I'm almost 60. I have no regret. There's, there's not even one week that I've turned back. And I have no regret for serving him and following him. Oh, yes. I have no regret. I have no regret for giving my life to Jesus when I did as a young man. All this smoking and drinking and following girls, and I have never done all those things. I've always just been serving the Lord. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I don't regret. I don't regret. Not even one week have I looked back to feel, why, why, what am I doing? No, 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 no. I'm glad I, I did it. The painful things that I have been through, I'm glad that I served the Lord. And now as eternity is approaching, it's nearer. I'm, near, I'm, nearing, I'm nearing a place I never was. I'm glad that I chose him. I'm glad that I paid the price. I'm glad that I lived to preach. I'm glad that I built the church. I'm glad that I fought all the wars that I fought. I'm glad that I stood for Jesus. I'm glad that I said what I said. I'm glad that I stood for the gospel as I stood for the gospel. Oh, yes. It's time. It's time. You know something? We are at the end. Everybody, people were expecting Ukraine to become a world war. But it didn't. But we could smell that it wanted to. And it would have come to America. We are at the end. This is the end. Let's give our, our best. Our best. Our everything. Uh, let's pour in everything we have. Let's give our time. Let's give our best days. Let's give our youthfulness. Let's give our strength to the Lord. This is the time to give our strength, our energy, our love, and to sacrifice whatever he wants. Oh, yes. It's time for you to stop saying, what is God going to do for me today? And to start saying, what can I do for God? What can I do? Not what, what, what will God do for me when I come to church, but what can I do for the Lord? Every standing. Everyone stand, please. Father, thank you for many people that are here today that are serving you, okay? Thank you for people that believe that they are called. If you are here and you believe that God has called you and you want to follow him and pay whatever price, because I sense there are people here you sense they need to pay a price to serve the Lord. And if you are here and you want to pay the price to serve the Lord, just lift your hand like this so I can see. And then I need you to come. I want to pray for some people in front here. If you sense they need to sacrifice particularly, you sense God is calling you, pay the price, give up the cross. Just come step forward here. I'm just going to pray with all of you here. Just come. Now, listen, I see a field. Please come quickly. I see in the realm of the spirit a field. It's like a field that is spreading. You know, like a cornfield. You can't see the end of it. There's somebody here in the realm of the spirit. You are going to walk in that field. It's a field of harvest. It's a field of souls. Lift your hand and receive your grace to receive your calling. There is a young man here. You have stood for other things. But that says the spirit. It's time to stand for him. It's time to stand for the calling. 
the call of God. You stood for other things and fought for other things. But now it's time to fight for him and to fight for his calling. Father, I thank you. I thank you for many. Oh, I see in the realm of the spirit something like something like warriors. I see some something like warriors, people that are warriors. Like you are you are dangerous fighters for the Lord. Lift your hands and just receive your calling. Father, I thank you for what you are doing today. Calling people from laziness, from doing nothing, from just hanging around, just watching, being on our phones, looking at social media. You are calling warriors. You are calling harvesters. Receive it now, the power of God. Thanks. Thanks, Jesus. Receive the grace. The grace to serve him in other lands. Oh, yes. The grace to serve him in other lands is coming on somebody. The grace to serve him in other lands is coming on somebody. Lift your hand and receive this grace to serve him in other lands and in other places. Father, I thank you. You stood for other things, but now you stand for Jesus and for his ministry. Oh, yes. Father, I thank you as I pray for these. Oh, yes. Thank you as I touch them, Lord. Thanks for your power. Thanks for your grace. Watch out. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Oh, you stood for other things. Watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's somebody I see you like. You're going to an evangelist. I don't know what. But God is going to use you. Evangelism. Whether it's here or outside here. God is going to use you. Lift your hand and receive this grace. Father, I thank you for evangelist Shuttlesworth, Lord. Thank you for power and expansion. Not, Lord, to be something famous in America, but something precious in your eyes. Something that you love and something that you desire. Not to be popular amongst popular people, but to be nice before you. Someone you smile at. Someone who when you see you are just happy. Someone you say, well done, good and faithful. Good and faithful, my boy. My boy, my speaker. My boy who stands for me. And my boy who loves me. Oh yes. Thanks, Jesus. For the great grace the great impartation in Jesus name oh yes come to me you come here lift your hands God God will use you lift your hands God will use you may you walk in his will and do his will close your eyes father as I lay hands on him let something from you be on him in the name of Jesus everybody lift your hand and just pray just pray thank God for this amazing morning where you are hearing his voice and you are hearing his will thanks 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 Thank you, Lord. Lift your hand and be blessed. Now, everyone in the congregation, lift your hand and be blessed. Lift your hand and be blessed. Lift your hand and be blessed. I see foreign lands, foreign lands. Great works, great works. Touch and use, Lord. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks for your grace. Thanks for your power. Be blessed and receive true glory and true blessing. Thanks, Jesus. For raising up beautiful servants of the Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you Lord. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Thanks for your servants. Thanks for your servants.
Thanks for your servant. Oh yes. Receive the power of God. Oh mashida la masumberi kabere le mende le mashenda le 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 Oh yes. Oh yes. Power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. Tazama shamadala palama. Everyone give thanks. Everyone give thanks. Receive it. Receive the grace. Give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. Power. Watch out. Give it. Bring it back to me. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this church. And I thank you for all the people that are here. I pray for everyone. Let the grace of yielding to God be upon them. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. You may go back to your seats. If you are here this morning, you are, you are not born again. Maybe somebody invited you to church, but you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You want to say, Pastor, pray with me. I want to give my life, my heart to Jesus Christ. I don't know who you are, but maybe deep down in your heart, you know that you are not really a Christian. If you die today or tomorrow, you don't know whether you go to heaven or hell. You want me to pray with you. You want to give your life to God. You want me to pray with you. Jesus is going to save you today. If you are here like that, just lift up your hand like this and I'm going to pray with you. God bless you. Just lift it up high. All right. I want to pray with you. I want to give your life to God, to Jesus. God bless you. If you've lifted your hand up, stand up on your feet. I'm going to pray with you. Wow. God bless you. Father, thank you for all, all, all of us are saved here today. We are blessed in the name of Jesus. Everyone lift your hand. Father, thank you for your blessing in this church. A blessing of salvation, of life. Lord, I believe that life has come. And that the cross shall be at the center of everything here from today. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone shouted, Amen. Thank you.